Thank you. So yes, my name is Clément Albergel. I'm a climate scientist with the European Space Agency uh, Climate Office. We are based in the UK. And together with my colleague, uh, Sophie Ebden, also from the Climate Office and uh, the Liaison Officer from Future Earth, we have submitted this uh, session to Geobon on how to use uh, satellite remote sensing to further highlight and emphasize the role of climate change as a driver of biodiversity and ecosystem uh, changes. We received quite a few uh, abstracts. We had to make uh, a selection. And then the uh, Visa uh, Bureau made uh, its own selection. So we have uh, four uh, speakers uh, today with us. So they can use uh, up to 15 to 20 minutes of the, uh, of the time uh, to between presentation and uh, question. Please don't go over 20 minutes. After that, I will just throw myself on the floor and hit the floor until you stop. It works very well according to my uh, children. So we'll proceed like, um, like that. Um, just, just before we start with the first speaker, I would like to tell you a few words about ISA's uh, climate program and why uh, we are uh, here with uh, Sophie in this uh, conference. So, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, is leading the international effort to combat climate change and keep global warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5, as set out in the Paris Agreement for Climate. The UNFCCC is the body responsible for driving the global action. And to make decisions on climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation, the UNFCCC requires observation, systematic observation of the Earth. They have delegated to the Global Climate Observing System, the GCOS, a public consultation to define a list of variables that represent climate and its variability at best. And GCOS came out with a list of 55 so-called essential climate variables. ECV. More than half of them can benefit from satellite Earth observation, and some of them can entirely be based on satellite Earth observation. As a direct response to this UNFCCC need in observation, ESA has started its climate program, the Climate Change Initiative, more than a decade ago. The Climate Change Initiative, CCI, is a research and development activity program coordinated amongst ESA member states that main objective is to develop global scale, long-term, robust, satellite-derived key component of the climate system, the essential climate variable. Focusing on this core group of ECVs that we can observe from space is at the heart of our program. We have to date 27 uh, projects that have generated 27 essential climate variables in different compartments of the Earth system, the ocean, atmosphere, over, um, over the land. And we do that by putting together, by fusing, 40 years of ESA Earth Observation Archives and combining those data with information from what we call third-party missions, missions that are not managed or owned by ESA, and current missions, including the Sentinel. All those data sets are freely available for any, anyone. You can access them on this uh, website. I will not go into too much technical details, but this is an example for the some moisture essential climate variables. It is by putting together by harmonizing data from 17 satellites in space since 1979 that we are able to develop a long-term climate data record spanning from 1979 to almost present time at uh, global, sc global scale. Going back to this session and to this conference, we have this long-term climate data uh, record. And within the next phase of ESA's climate program, we want to address new user community, including biodiversity. We have the ECVs, and we need to understand what is left to be done so they can be helpful for the essential biodiversity uh, variables, the ABVs. Maybe it's easy, it's, it's known by you, not by us, not by me, so I'd be happy to discuss about, uh, about that. We want to build on the work performed under uh, future EU program at ISA, represented by Mark Paganini uh, this week, to expand research and development activity when it comes to biodiversity in the climate uh, area. And this is all based on the ongoing um, discussion about the definition of the EBVs and the recognition that spatial remote sensing is a key tool for providing data at the spatial and temporal scale necessary for EBVs to be useful for decision making. And on that, I let Sophie introduce the uh, next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello? Oh, that one's working now. Okay, so uh, the first speaker 
um, is Roberto Chavez from the uh, Institute of Geography in Valparaiso in Chile. Uh, and he will present on uh, remote sensing of vegetation phonology, which is a key regulator of ecosystem processes and biosphere feedbacks to the climate system. So his title is an integrated land surface phonology monitoring system for Chile, advances on remote sensing platform and the PhenoCam field network. Thanks, Roberto. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, here Isa to organize this session and to give me the opportunity to show a little bit the advances on our phenological monitoring system. Uh, this project is, um, is, is a project together um, with a team of people from the Laboratory of Ge Geoinformation and Remote Sensing from the Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile, uh, together with the Forest Service and the Ministry of Environment. And it's funded by the Chilean um, uh, Research and Technology Agency. Well, the outline of my presentation today uh, is uh, these four points. First, I would like to introduce the concept of land surface phenology, as uh, it was introduced here, essential biodiversity variable candidate. Then I would like to also introduce the approach we are using to research phenology, the NPFEN R package. Then I will move to show the, advance, the advances of our phenological platform. And then I will finish with some next steps of this research and implementation project. Why phenology? Well, it's been introduced that there is uh, under discussion at this really moment, uh, which are going to be the essential biodiversity variables. We cannot measure everything regarding biodiversity. And for countries as Chile, it's very important to have this framework so we can really go for the important ones and try to contribute to the global efforts. And phenology then is one of these variables and is uh, classified as species traits. The definition of phenology is the presence, absence, abundance, or duration of seasonal activities in organisms. And in our case, we are going to be very much focused on leaf phenology of vegetation. So basically, what we are trying to measure from space is the, actually it's not the complete leaf area index, which is you know the amount of foliage we have in vegetation, but only the green leaf foliage, which is the responsible of the chlorophyll absorption feature, which is the base for most of the vegetation indices uh, that allows us to um, try to um, understand these seasonal dynamics. You know, like the annual cycle from senescence, uh, green up, um, and then senescence again. When I tried to explain this uh, to the colleagues from the ran rangers in national parks, also from the environmental agencies, I explained that the land surface phenology is kind of the heart beating of vegetation. So we have these seasonal pulses, and what we can uh, get from these indices is just the top of the mountains of every heartbeat is the peak of the growing season, and then we have the senescence. In this picture, we can see the seasonal behavior of Notophagus pumilio forest in Patagonia, southern Chile, and what you see there is a time series of the enhanced vegetation index, which is retrieved from NASA MODIS data. If you look very carefully, you can, you can see that the heartbeat in the year 2019 was a little bit lower. So when we propose this monitoring framework to our authorities, so comes the logical question, okay, we see the heartbeat is a little bit lower, but is it really serious? So 
we have to take actions based on this uh, data set. And we try to answer that question in an operational way using this MPFN R package. The MPFN R package have this, has been published in a paper that I shared with you there, and also there is a tutorial in, the, uh, in our uh, website. But let me try to explain briefly how this MPFEM approach uh, work. Here, what you can see is, oh, sorry, uh, this one. Well, so from any point in the territory, so this is uh, um, any vegetation index you have, this is the Patagonian forest, you can pull up for every pixel this kind of time series. So here, I would like to highlight one year, which is rather normal in Notophagus pumilio forest, and here we can see an insect outbreak going on. So what the MPFN approach does is to make this reference uh, plot. So we, we can define a reference period, which can be before the outbreak, or it can be even the whole time series. And then in this plot, which, is, which has the vegetation index in the y-axis and the day of the growing season in the x-axis, so 365 days. So we put all mountains or pulses together, we have a scatter plot. If we make this heat map on this scatter plot, we can check the frequency reference distribution of the seasonal uh, phenology cycle. This line, which is the maximum uh, frequency is going to be our reference for calculating anomalies, for example. But also, we have the frequency distribution. So for any moment in time we want to assess, for example, the outbreak, we can calculate the anomaly, which is going to be negative, probably. But also, we can see if this anomaly is really falling outside the normal reference frequency distribution with a number, which is going from 1 to 99. So if, the, if like in this red arrow, the outbreak is really reaching the values of winter time, so it's a complete defoliation, so the RFD, so reference frequency distribution, is going to be 99, and we are seeing a complete uh, extreme anomaly. I hope it was clear. One advantage of the MPFEN uh, approach was that we were able to um, make the reference for very different kind of vegetation. Chile is a 4,000 kilometers long country in the southern tip of South America, and we have, this is the NDVI map, oh, oh sorry, it's an enhanced vegetation index map, so you can see like nothing of vegetation or very little in Atacama Desert, and then you have very green vegetation in Patagonia. So one advantage of the MPFEN uh, approach is that it's a non MPFEN stands out for non-parametric phenology, is that we can make the all sort of types of annual phenologies, but also we can study the variation of the phenology, which is also very important to assess whether the anomaly is extreme or not. For example, we perform a mapping exercise of the 2019 hyperdrought that was taking place in central Chile. Oh, sorry. Central Chile over there. And then we were defining that extreme anomalies are going to be when the negative anomalies overpass the 90% of the reference frequency distribution. We picked as reference period uh, from 2000 to 2000. 2010. And then the output of the NPFN uh, package is these three maps. So on the left, you can see the raw negative anomalies of the vegetation index. In the center, you can see the position of the record at a given date uh, within the reference frequency distribution. So the blue areas are the ones really exceeding the 90% of the reference frequency distribution. So we are seeing a very extreme anomaly. And then the third map, uh, we are only showing the negative anomalies when the 
RFD of 0 0.9 is overpass. So we have a map of extreme anomalies, and then the authorities can really define which one is going to be like the more affected area in central Chile. Well, based on this uh, approach, we can calculate for the entire area, so which proportion of the territory is under an extreme anomaly. Here we can see that uh, before the hyper uh, drought of 2000, 2019, we also had a very long drought, which was between 2012 and 2016. At this time, about 50% of the territory was under a very extreme drought. However, in 2017, there was a relief, and there was a time with more rain, and then we can see also uh, extreme greenings that caused, even in Atacama Desert, the so-called Blooming Desert. I think there is a picture of the desert somewhere there. So it's a really fantastic uh, overview you have. It's not central Chile, but northern Chile. But all, also in central Chile was also very extremely green. So based on this approach, together with the Ministry of um, Environmental uh, Environment and also the um, uh, Forest Service, we are developing this system that is uh, contributing to uh, management of the whole vegetation uh, uh, territory. The platform looks like, th like this. So we translate the reference frequency distribution position in, in a more simple uh, output, which is showing like a, uh, um, a traffic light, red alerts when you overpass the RFD of 0 0.9. Also in this platform, we can see uh, the position of the Fenocam cameras. The Fenogam network, you know, is an effort, it's an, it's an international effort to get also pictures uh, of the landscape from which you can also retrieve um, a, green, um, uh, a greening index, so you can also monitor phenology from the photos. So we are uh, pushing to have our also national system, and at the moment uh, we have 10 cameras online and we want to keep on growing on this effort. So the next steps for the system, now we are uh, finishing the first uh, project. Uh, it's, all, it's, it's only for central Chile, and it's using, at the moment, the NASA MODIS dataset. The Fenocam network is an expansion. We are including also other efforts in Chile, like the one from the Institute on Ecology and Evolution. Oh, sorry, it's the Institute of Ecology and Biodiversity. They also have cameras in the FluxNet um, network. And now, we are super happy that we got another grant that we uh, will allow to expand uh, the system northwards and also will include a new satellite data because, you know, MODIS is coming to an end. And also, to grow to Atacama, we need more finer spatial resolution. Uh, we are planning to join the International Phenogam Network, and of course, we would like to contribute to the effort of GeoBon. And this is my last uh, slide. Uh, I also want to acknowledge all the work from my colleagues in the Laboratory of Remote Sensing and GIS in the Catholic University and our sponsors as well. And thanks to you to uh, come early from the coffee and listen to this presentation. Thanks a lot, Roberto. Um, are there any questions from the room? I have a question about uh, the timing, so you, you showed the LAI um, time series. Um, I wondered if you'd seen like a narrowing or a widening in the timing of the leaf, uh, leaves coming out or going in um, due to like over a long term or due to the droughts. Like, have you seen that kind of effect? Yeah, that, that is a good question because uh, MPFEN is designed to make like an aggregated phenology. It's, it's not the phenology of one year only. Uh, although we are uh, studying also the dynamics of how phenology is changing using moving uh, windows. You know, you, you need more or less five or six growing seasons to make a good estimation of the phenology and the variation. But if you, if you move one year ahead and then you calculate the phenologies, you can really catch some trends. So you can use it that, that way. 
and it has some advantages from the parametric approaches, which are fitting uh, the logistic queue, for example, uh, day by day. I, they really rely on the fitting uh, uh, process. Any, any further questions? Oh, one over there. Thanks. Thank you, Roberto. That was fascinating. Uh, maybe two questions. I, you might have said it, but I think I missed it. Uh, Fenocam, what kind of information do you get from the Fenocam that you don't get from the satellite Earth observation? And second, what kind of applications, maybe policy applications, do you see uh, possible from your results? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, they allow me to elaborate a little bit more on the Fenocams. Um, actually, you get the, the Fenocam system is, is not new. There is a U.S. Fenocam system, a European Fenocam system, and we are proud to have now the Chilean one with a little cameras, but we, are, we, we, we hope to grow. And from the cameras, it's just an RGB photo. So what you, you calculate is a, is a green index, which is a ratio between the green band divided by the other tree. It's very simple, but still showing you the greening process on, on the picture. Usually, you can catch, the, for example, the start of the growing season. You can catch it earlier on the photo and later on the remote sensing uh, data because you need to green up a pixel of Landsat, for example, 30 by 30 or Sentinel 10 by, by 10. In this case, is, is modest, even, even larger. So you can adjust a little bit what you are seeing in the, in the remote sensing data uh, using the, 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 the ground data. This is more like the technical part, but from the political part, you cannot imagine the impact that pictures have on rangers or on the, on the media. When I, when I make this map of red alerts, they say, well, OK, there's something terrible is happening, but we don't know exactly what. But if you put the red alert together with a picture, it, it's really, really impressive. Uh, for example, in this 2019 hyper drought, the, the senescence of leaves in central Chilean forests took place at the end of December. So in the middle of the summer, there was autumn, and, that's, and, we, and we put on, on media. Well, media was uh, asking us a little bit what's going on. And then these uh, pictures, more than the maps, <laughs> showing that the, the, the forest was getting red in December was like huge uh, effect on policy and also on normal, normal people. And there was another question, I guess. I think I Thanks. forgot. Thanks, Roberto. I think we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to invite Leila Yusufide uh, Naini to the platform to give your presentation on mapping lichen availability and accessibility in the context of caribou winter habitat selection. Um, so you're going to be talking about the changing snowpack conditions. Thank you. So hello everyone, uh, I'm so thankful of uh, being here uh, for this opportunity, uh, thankful of Joe Bone and Isa. Uh, so uh, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Sherbrooke and uh, I'm going to present the preliminary results of our project. So caribous are really important species because of their impacts uh, on the Arctic and subarctic and uh, the indigenous lives. They, and over the last decades, the population have been decreased drastically and uh, have raised uh, so many concerns over the future and socioeconomic impacts of their loss. Uh, during the winter, uh, caribous uh, forage and eat lichen, which gives them the energy they need to forage uh, on, the, uh, on the snow. But, um, but uh, the snow properties such as depth, uh, density, and hardness affects uh, the forage accessibility uh, very much, especially when we have the layer of ice inside the snowpack as a result of rain and snow events, uh, which is due to uh, climate warming. Uh, so 
The main objective of our project is to improve our understanding of the impacts of lichen abundance and availability, accessibility uh, for the caribou um, habitat selection. And our first um, sub-objective is to develop a, a regional fractional lichen cover model uh, to estimate the cover percentage, uh, which we use the uh, multi-scale imagery. And then we, uh, we want to um, implement the snowpack simulations to have the estimation of snow properties. Uh, we produce the occurrence, accumulative occurrence of rain and snow events. And uh, at the end, we apply all the, um, these created layers into multi-scale habitat selection model to link the finest scale forage behavior to um, broad scale climate um, conditions. In this presentation, uh, I uh, present the preliminary results of developing a um, fractional liking cover model. Uh, so before that, we need to know what, which herd of caribou that we study and what is exactly lichen. So um, caribou, which is called reindeer, they um, reside fairly in the north above the latitude of 50 degree. They have high variability in, gen in genetic um, behavior, morphology, and ecology. So um, based on that, um, there are so many challenges in the uh, classification uh, below the level of species. Um, therefore, in 2011, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada uh, outlined uh, 12 um, classes of caribou uh, in Canada. As you can see, the caribou uh, number, um, the DU number four, which is uh, delineated in orange, um, it's called Eastern Migratory Caribou. Uh, it has four subpopulations, George River, Leaf River, Southern Hudson Bay, and Cape Churchill. The total uh, range is over one and a half million square kilometer. Uh, for the George River herd, um, you can see on the left, uh, the, the um, population have been drastically decreased over the decades. And as the population decreased, the distribution of the range also is decreased about 85%. So, which, which uh, high rise the uh, importance of uh, establishing uh, conservation plans for this species. Um, what we know about lichen, lichens are symbiotic organisms. They are the combination of a fungal partner, which provides the structure, and a, a photosynthetic partner, which can uh, typically a, a green algae. And they are the important source of food for caribou. Um, in, uh, totally on the terrestrial earth surface, uh, it covers 8 to 10 percent of the earth, uh, typically in subarctic and arctic. Um, lichen woodlands are the ecosystem that define as the open crown uh, forest um, dominated by black spruce and large. And you can see the range in Canada uh, from Atlantic um, from Atlantic coast to the uh, Rocky Mountain, uh, which is delineated in orange. And this is the video of the eastern uh, Quebec uh, in lichen woodlands. Uh, so, what are the challenges that we have in uh, for um, providing the lichen cover maps? Uh, is that the caribou ranges are so big, so large, and the conventional methods are not um, efficient, they are time consuming and costly. Remote sensing can provide useful information, but, always there is a but, uh, is that the lichens are so small, uh, they have a small patches, and they are, cannot be directly uh, detected uh, from the coarse resolution satellite imagery. So what we, um, what, oh, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, How can I play? Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. 
So our solution is to uh, have a multi-scale approach consisting of three uh, different levels of remote sensing data. And then we use uh, the uh, artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms uh, to process these data. As you can see in this video, we uh, start from UAV imagery and then we upscale scale to the satellite levels. The UAV imagery has a very high resolution, but it covers um, small portions, and then satellite imagery covers um, a very large areas, according to Caribou's herd range. So our methodology, as uh, you saw, uh, has three main uh, levels, UAV, Sentinel-2, and Landsat. We start by processing of UAV data. Uh, we classify them by random forest uh, classification, which is the algorithm, on, uh, supervised algorithm that use ensemble learning, which combines the different um, uh, results of classification to have more accurate results. Then we upscale all the results to the level, to, to the resolution of the next level, which in this case is uh, Sentinel-2, and then we use these um, data as a training in the random forest regression model to have the uh, Sentinel fractional liking cover. Um, the reason that we do is that uh, it extends the training data, uh, data sets. Um, we do the same process for the next level, which is Landsat, and we do this process in the platform of Google Earth Engine, which is a very useful open cloud uh, platform that we have access to the uh, collection of Sentinel-2 and uh, Landsat and uh, um, other data sets, and we can do the processing in that platform. Um, the study area is according to the range of uh, George River, and um, as you can see, we collected the um, data sets in um, um, green polygons. Uh, we collected the UAV data sets over 20 sites in two years, and the um, resolution of these imageries are from one to three centimeter. Um, we then process every, pre process every UAV imagery, and also we can, uh, we can produce the um, 3D model of each um, imagery. Um, after that, we need to classify each UAV imagery into two classes of lichen and non lichen. We use the uh, RGB bands of the imagery as the predictor, and we uh, provide the algorithm with some training polygons. Then we can have the uh, classified map. As you can see, the lichens are depicted in red polygons. We also use the Sentinel-2 uh, satellite data. They are available since 2015. We do the processing in the uh, Google Earth engine, and uh, we collect the, we selected the data at the same time that we collected the UAV data. The next step, we calculate the fractional liking cover for um, it uh, inside a grid is uh, pixels of Sentinel-2. Uh, uh, so the fractional cover means that the number of pixels that are present um, for a lichen that are present in the grid of 10 meter. In the right, you can see the result of this scaling up. Then at the end of this step, we can have 20,000 samples of um, lichen cover percentage. Uh, then we use these um, samples in, into our um, model fitting. We have the sentinel bands as the predictor. We fit the model, and then we analyze the, um, assess the accuracy of the model based on multiple scenarios. We reach the bet, uh, best result when we keep the, we use all the UAV sites for the training and we keep 20 percent randomly for validation. We did also external validation, which reduced the accuracy of our model. This slide also shows the importance of um, bands of Sentinel in the model fitting, that we can see the most important band is the band number uh, two, which is in the wavelength of blue, and it's corresponding to the literature review of lichen, uh, spectral lichen analysis that shows that lichen has more spectral reflectance in the blue rather than um, 
uh, green vegetations because they have eosinic acid pigments. Um, this map uh, represents the um, prediction of lichen cover over a um, broader area uh, on another year. Uh, so um, it, it means that we apply our trained model uh, to predict the lichen coverage uh, over um, another area. Uh, the conclusion that we can have is UAV imagery can provide very high resolution ground truth data. It can extend our uh, ground uh, data selection. Um, Google Earth Engine platform um, do the analysis very fast, and uh, even though it has its own limitation in terms of memory issues, in terms of the uh, classification methods that they provide, um, and the first scale shows that um, we have acceptable accuracy to predict the lichen cover, but we also need to do further for model assessments based on the, uh, in terms of data collection for validation and also combination of inputs. Um, the next step is to we scale up to the next level, which is Landsat for temporal analysis. And, um, Last one. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, uh, I don't know. Okay. So our next step is to um, prep, uh, prepare the um, uh, climate data that we use for uh, snow simulation that you can see in the right. And we also calculate the rain and snow occurrence by using passive microwave data. At the end, we use all of these layers into habitat modeling. And I would like to thank you. Oh. <laughs> That's no worries, <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Leila. That's a really nice presentation. Um, have we got any questions for Leila from the floor? Um, have you got a question? Oh, there's a question. Thanks. Thanks, that was really interesting. Do you know anything about the spectral signatures of lichen? Like, would hyperspectral imagery improve your classification, do you think? Um, I, um, as I read in the literature review, um, there are, they have some research that they use the hyperspectral imagery for the um, differentiated the lichen species, because it has a varied um, species, and it's so useful for um, delineating the uh, different species. But in the mapping, I haven't seen so much use of um, hyperspectral imagery. I also have a very naive question. Uh, could we also imagine to the, uh, inverse the problem and to try to look at where the caribou are to locate the lichen and where, and where they stop? So maybe not in this type of biomes, but further north, can we use satellite imagery and combine that with machine learning to detect uh, herds of, uh, of caribou and uh, where do they move? Um, so you mean that we use, uh, in the north, we use the location of the caribous to model the species distribution? So actually, they use the location for the species distribution, but if you want to detect them into, in through the satellite imagery, the, I know that there are some research that they directly, uh, they do have some uh, scaling up to detect the um, animals, uh, in this case, caribou. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Isabel Helferstein from the University of Zurich, who will present on trait-based diversity from Sentinel-2 and links to drought resilience in temperate forests. Okay, so thank you very much and thank you um, for your attention for the next minutes where I'm going to tell you about how we link trait-based diversity to drought resilience using satellites. Yeah, so as we're all terribly aware, global change is a very ongoing process. 
um, threatening biodiversity, ecosystem services and ecosystem functioning and ultimately humanity. And one um, consequence of global change that we are uh, feeling today um, already is uh, amplified regional drought stress. Um, this poses a, oh, that shouldn't be happening. This poses a, a challenge on forests to maintain ecosystem functioning and ecosystem services um, and points out the importance of biodiversity as a mitigating ecosystem property. Um, the link between biodiversity and ecosystem functioning is something that is re researched a lot in um, experiments and also field studies. And what we want to do now is to bring this to large scale assessments using Sentinel-2 data. There we go. Um, we do that using functional diversity, um, which means we're measuring diversity using functional traits. Those can be morphological, for example, be, um, regarding canopy height or canopy density, physiological, regarding biochemical traits or leaf water content, or phenological traits, for example, timing of green up or leaf senescence. And the cool thing about those is they can be easily and very straightforwardly uh, be derived using remote sensing data. So in a first step, in order to use Sentinel-2 imagery to derive functional diversity, we in the first step we upscaled um, existing methods from airborne spectroscopy to Sentinel-2 data um, in a um, temperate forest that you can see on the right image at uh, Lagern Forest located in the north of Switzerland, um, a temperate forest ecosystem around 20 kilometers from Zurich, which in a second step that I will come back to later, we also increase the extent to the green area that you can see in the lower inset map, um, which is included in one Sentinel-2 tile represented by the, the square that you can see. So when we change um, our method from airborne um, hyperspectral systems to spaceborne systems, um, there are uh, temporal, spatial, and spectral ch uh, changes to the resolution. So on one hand, we profit from using satellites by uh, having five, three to five days between two um, images with two satellites in the region of Zurich. Um, when before we had campaigns that we had to plan, and at Lagern Forest we um, have two to six campaigns per year. Um, on the other hand, spatial resolution changes drastically from two meter pixel size to 10, 20, or 60 meter pixel size, depending on the spectral band. And spectral resolution changes from hyperspectral uh, to multispectral with 284 uh, spectral bands um, and only 13 for Sentinel-2 of which when we only use 10 and 20 meter um, bands, we are left with 10. This is slow. So in order to, um, to see the effects of the change in spectral and spatial resolution on the, on the diversity data, um, we isolated, we tried to isolate um, those effects by step uh, by changing the resolution step by step. So in the first um, step, which uh, we switched from 284 bands using a spectral convolution to an artificial data set that has the spatial resolution of um, of uh, the airborne data, um, but the spectral resolution of the Sentinel-2 data. And in the second step, with spatial resampling, we moved from two meter pixel size to 20 meter pixels. Um, Doing so, we now have an airborne image that has the same spatial and spectral properties as Sentinel-2 data, and we're able to compare the results um, with the major difference um, coming from either solar to sensor angle or the, date, uh, the timing of acquisition. Especially with the spectral resolution, we have to be very, um, very aware on um, what we're looking at for interpretation. So when before, um, two meter pixels made up, like multiple pixels made up um, one crown with the, with the crown diameter in our research area being six meters um, on average, multiple crowns make up one pixel at 20 meter uh, resolution. So we move from, from individuals to um, more, more of communities. 
I really have to push this button earlier. <laughs> so we derive free physiological traits um, all over, um, like distributed all over the spectrum uh, um, available with Sentinel-2. One being chlorophyll content in the red edge area of the spectrum, mostly linking to productivity, growth, and photosynthesis. Carotenoid chlorophyll um, ratio um, with the CCI, which you might remember from today's keynote by Janine, um, which links to stress and, uh, or uh, in our case, mostly due to excess light input using the visible range of the spectrum and water content from the infrared part, um, mostly linking to canopy water content and um, enables seeing differences between broadleaf and needle trees. This is how those physiological traits look on the maps. So um, in the top image, you can see uh, apex data and, uh, and two meter resolutions, and in the lower image, you can see Sentinel-2. And what you can see here is um, in green patches, you can see younger forests that are, uh, that are high in productivity and growth, mostly caused to, uh, due to a, a storm 25 years ago. Um, at the ridge of Lagern Forest, um, we have very shallow soils, very rocky soils, and a lot of excess light input. Um, this is why the, uh, the ridge is characterized by high carotenoid content. And in blue, we see um, mostly uh, very, very diverse um, forests with a lot, with a high forest mixture between needle and broadleaf trees, um, and deep, uh, deep soils with a lot of uh, water capacity. And we see when here in the lower image, we see the 20 meter pixel size, where we can see that while the, ch the differences in the communities are still there, we do lose a lot of variance between the two images. So now that we have those three physiological traits, we use a multidimensional trace base to derive functional richness and evenness. Um, we also work with other diversity metrics. These are the two I want to present today. <laughs> functional richness is uh, a measure of the extent of the community niche, answering the question on how many different values there are present in the community niche. We here use concave holes from alpha shapes to, uh, to represent functional richness. And we also have a look at functional evenness, which is a measure of regularity, answering the question on how regular the different values are distributed. So if all the branches of the minimum spanning tree um, in the lower right image would be of a similar length, then functional evenness would be expected to be high. We do this using a moving window approach um, over, the, over the image, always um, targeting a calculation area around the pixel of interest. So we upscaled, um, f f we upscaled those functional diversity metrics here represented by functional richness. And we found that, especially for functional richness, we, found a new, we, we see a new value range depending on uh, the number of the pixels in the calculation. Um, and also due to the fact that um, we have community weighted means for the pixels at 20 meter pixel size. However, the interpretation of large scale patterns is still similar um, with, for example, low function richness at the ridge of Lagern Forest. And we also observe a great influence of mixed pixels around forest edge and gaps, which is here visible by these yellow golden blobs around um, forest gaps. We also had a look at the change in diversity area relationships um, that drastically change with pixel size and uh, found a minimum calculation area for all different diversity metrics at uh, a minimum of three pixel of a three pixel radius for 20 meter resolution that translates into around 60 meters that we um, that we need in minimum to calculate those um, diversity metrics the green arrows at this one okay thank you <laughs> So now that we um, so now that we upscaled um, the, the method to a new sensor, we now have um, much more freedom due to Sentinel-2 data. Um, due to Sentinel-2 data, so now we can also enlarge the extents, um, the extent that we were working on. So Lagern is now in the middle of uh, our new research area. Um, what you can see here are two cantons of Switzerland. On the right is the Canton of Zurich and um, 
And in the west, there's the uh, canton of Argau. Both are around 1,500 square kilometers in size, of which one third is uh, covered in forests. Um, as you can see, it is quite a patchy forest, um, or um, distributed all over the research area. And here we calculated our functional traits and functional diversity, which we are now able to, um, to link to forest, to, to forest drought response. So um, the summer drought of 2018 was the, the, one of the most severe summer droughts um, in Switzerland since measurements started in 1864. Um, and uh, a colleague of mine, Joan Sturm, um, developed a method for Sentinel-2 to quantify forests' reactions to drought using the summer drought of 2018 in resistance recovery and resilience using NDWI um, and, how this and how it changed over the years. This is what you can see here. So for, the, for, both, uh, for all the forested area, for all of the forested area, um, you can see the mean change in NDWI from 2017, the pre-drought year, to 2018, um, which is the drought year, which we quantify to be resistance, the, and then the recovery to the post-drought year of 2019. And we also calculated resilience, which is the change from the pre-drought year 2017 to the post-drought year of 2020, in order to be as independent as possible from recovery or resistance. We can map those changes. And also, oh, now it's even working too well. There we are. Um, in order to compare them to, uh, fun to our functional diversity. So um, this is now the, the whole method. So the left part is, already, is, is what I already presented. And on the right, you see NDWI change over the years of uh, 2017 to 2020, which we now can um, compare to our functional diversity. We did this um, by binning the diversity data along the value range of functional richness and evenness into 1,000 bins. Um, and then for all the, all the pixels and forested area that fall into these, um, into these uh, levels of functional diversity, we calculated um, resistance, recovery, and resilience. Our hypothesis is that more, uh, more diverse forests should have suffered less from this extreme drought event. Um, as we know that ecosystem functioning was shown to increase with diversity in field studies and experiments. However, we don't know how it works at these large scales. This is how it works. Um, I'm going to walk you through those three panels. So in the top left panel, you see um, the relationship between resistance and functional richness for, um, for all the 1,000 bins over the area. And we saw uh, an increase of resistance with functional richness. And, for, and in the lower panel, you see resistance and evenness, which also increased um, up to a certain point when two, two, like at high, very high regularity, we saw a decrease in resistance again. We also found that recovery um, is very dependent on resistance. So areas that showed very uh, low resistance also showed high recovery, where there was an overshooting for, um, for 2019 in all the areas um, of the research site. We also, um, we also saw that for, for richness, there was a logarithmic increase in uh, resistance and a logarithmic decrease in recovery. And for resilience, so for the change of 2017 to 2020, we saw an increase with functional richness and a decrease with functional evenness. Um, so as a conclusion, um, observing functional diversity continuously in time and space using satellite imagery works. Um, however, it is very important to keep the spatial and spectral resolution in mind when scaling assessments to landscape scales and also when changing sensors. Forest resistance and resilience, as shown here, link to trait-based richness and evenness. Um, and there is more promising, promising applications at landscape scales um, for example, also using the, the very high um, temporal resolution of Sentinel-2 for monitoring diversity. Uh, hopefully, those re um, hopefully those results will be available as a preprint very soon. Um, and with that, I would really like to thank you, if that works one last time. No.
<laughs> and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Any questions, please, for Isabel? Maybe I can ask again a, a naive uh, question. Do you think that it's possible to combine a different type of, uh, of satellites to go back in time before the Sentinel-2 era? Could we imagine uh, looking at uh, similar spectral uh, information from Landsat mm -hmm. to have some harmonized long time series back, back 10, um, 15 years ago? Yes, I'm actually thinking a lot about this question myself. Um, so because we're using trait-based diversity um, from, from spectral indices, as long as the bands to calculate the sp uh, those indices are around, we can work with them. Um, for Sentinel-2, one of the main um, assets that we have is the, is the red edge part that was really, really helpful. However, we can adapt the method to work with other sensors. Um, it, it depends a little bit. We might lose some information, but I guess there is some, some way to work that out, yeah. Have you had any interest from forest managers for uh, using this? Um, at those very large scales, um, it might be very interesting to know for managers um, what they can do in order to, to uh, get through more, for more severe and more frequent droughts, of course. At smaller scales, we already saw um, that managing your forest in patches is really, really helpful. Um, we also um, what we also do at the moment is also having a look at larger um, different regions of forest management strategies and compare, compare those. So there is surely a lot of inf lots of information to get out of that, yes. Thanks a lot. Let's uh, thank Isabel again. <laughs> okay, our final... Our final speaker is uh, Sylvia Wood, um, uh, who will talk about quantifying the benefit scape and risk scape of the urban canopy under climate change. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. I realize I'm the last thing between you and lunch, so I'll try to make this worth your while. Um, this talk is a little bit different in scale and scope from the three previous great presenters that came ahead of me. I'm gonna bring you back down to a sort of much more human-based scale, talking about cities and how remote sensing and other tools can be used to build uh, climate resilient urban canopies. Uh, and so just to give you a quick sense of who I am, so I work for Habitat, which is an environmental consulting firm here in Montreal. And our mission is to accompany cities, uh, landowners, and other communities to put in place nature-based solutions to protect biodiversity and to manage their ecosystems uh, for resilience. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about some work we've been doing uh, in the city of Montreal and other cities across Quebec, uh, trying to build these new tools that can help them to manage their canopies for resilience, um, specifically climate resilience. And this is work that's been funded by the David Suzuki Foundation, as well as the Quebec Ministry for uh, Economy, Innovation, and Energy. It's not as easy as it looks. Exactly. Uh, so many of you are aware, cities are increasingly experiencing the extreme events associated with climate change. We're having greater, more frequent storms, flood events, droughts, heat waves, and these are all taking its toll on citizens living in cities. And this is having not only an impact on citizens, but also on nature itself in cities. And in response, many cities are returning to nature-based solutions to try to address some of these challenges. So they're looking at how they can implement uh, canopy planting strategies or other green space strategies to help reduce some of these negative impacts. And we know that canopies are especially effective for helping to mitigate temperatures in cities, reduce stormwater runoff, improve air quality, provide habitat for biodiversity, and also contribute to wellness and uh, improve mental wellness and uh, well-being for humans. As a result, uh, the GBF has also included a target specifically on increasing green space and blue spaces in urban centers, so that's target 12, uh, with a specific aim to try to increase the area, quality, connectivity, access to, benefits from uh, blue and green spaces in urban areas. And so there's really an emphasis on cities to take proactive management to try to put these in place in order to address the type of climate impacts that we're expecting to see in the near future. However, People are not the only uh, individuals that are going to be affected by climate change in cities. The ecosystems themselves are also at risk. 
We know that you know, more intense heat waves and droughts can reduce the cooling effects of trees in cities. More intense storms or breaking branches cause a wa causing water logging, uh, killing off a number of species across our cities. And new pests and diseases that are coming with milder climates are also having a huge impact, especially here where the emerald ash borer, which recently arrived a few years ago, causing major defoliation and often tree mortality. And so as cities move forward in thinking about how they want to be able to implement these green uh, nature-based strategies to address climate change, we also need to be doing them in a way that's smart, that's going to make sure that those species and what we put in place are going to be there into the future, regardless of what nature can throw at it. And so today, what I want to talk to you about is uh, our tool set that we've been building for helping cities to plan climate-resilient urban canopies. Um, and this is composed primarily of five different steps, and so I want to walk you through those five steps today. So the first one is really about knowing your canopy. We can't plan uh, and manage what we don't know. And so this typically takes the form of an inventory, a species inventory. So uh, a CSV file, a shape file that says which species are planted where, how big they are, and what condition they are. The second part is understanding how we think those species are gonna fare into the future. So modeling out our canopy under different climate change scenarios and understanding where we're expecting them to survive, thrive, or unfortunately potentially die so that we know where we need to be intervening in order to address those changes head on before they hit us. Step three is understanding how those species are expected to cope with sort of these extreme events that we know are gonna hit us, uh, some from droughts, which we've seen in Chile and in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, to major storms or floods that are affecting our cities today here in Montreal. Uh, so we understand where we need to reinforce that canopy in order to make it more resilient. Four is not forgetting the people trying to understand who needs access to those green spaces for the benefits that they're gonna provide um, and who doesn't have access right now. So trying to understand spatially across the city how can we best implant these systems and actually to have the benefits that we want to achieve. And lastly is coming up with a plan for how to plant uh, for diversity and for inclusion across cities. So step one is really about knowing uh, your canopy. And for most cities that involves, as I mentioned, an urban uh, inventory of tree species that are planted. This is a very costly and time expensive endeavor to undertake like all biodiversity sampling. It requires teams to go out into the field for weeks or months um, at a cost of you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And so only the wealthiest of cities actually have an urban inventory. And typically that's not updated very often. And so this really causes a barrier because that's just the very first step in this whole process. If you don't have an urban inventory, we can't really move forward very quickly. And so we've been working uh, to try to develop uh, a way to automate this process for cities to make it more cost effective and faster to do. And so we've been working with different types of remote sensing data and AI tools to try to automate this process. So increasingly, LIDAR is available uh, for cities and using point clouds, uh, we can extract treetop locations and that can provide us our first geospatial uh, tool, which is a point cloud of where all the different trees are located in cities, both public and private. Even the best cities only usually have a public data set. They don't know where their private trees are. So this is a huge step already. Second, we can pair this uh, with high uh, resolution multispectral data from Worldview 2, Worldview 3, other types of satellites that are available um, to try to classify what those trees are in those locations. So we can pair our uh, data coming up from the LiDAR in terms of texture with all the different types of indicators from EVI, NDVI, et cetera, um, to actually try to classify what types of trees we're looking at. We've had pretty good success actually in Montreal. We've been able to identify with fairly high accuracy around 82%, 11 different species which make up the majority of our uh, canopy composition. And so now we have a geodata spatial, a, a geospatial data set that tells us where our trees are and what they're most likely to be. The last part of the equation is understanding something about that particular tree that allows us to understand its function in the ecosystem. And this is usually uh, a measure of size. So diameter at breast height is the typical uh, measure that's used in these surveys. And so by taking the species height estimate from the LIDAR data as well as this uh, species identity, we can create allometric equations that allow us to understand or estimate its expected size. And so for a relatively uh, fast uh, analysis, we're able to create a first approximation of an inventory for species uh, across cities, which provides the basis for the next few steps. The second step was to understand how those species are going to fare into the future. And for this, we really need to understand how species have fared to date in these, in these landscapes. Growing in a city is not the same as growing in a forest. Trees are under very different pressures from sort of soil compaction, heat extremes, population, et cetera. And so we wanted to understand how different species are growing in urban landscapes today so we can estimate how they might do in the future. 
So to do this, we created random forest models for 85 different species where we had sufficient uh, information. Uh, we paired that with uh, growth estimates that came from inventories across Montreal, other cities in Quebec, as well as Europe. Uh, and we developed growth curves that estimate how species are gonna do today in blue. Ooh, let's see if I can use this. Aha. Um, using historical and uh, climate data, and then we can swap that out for future projections using world clim data to get an estimate of whether those species are expected to do better when they're potentially here when they're young, or potentially fare worse um, into the future under these different growth predictions. And then we can take that and model that out for each individual species across the landscape and have an assessment of where uh, and which species are gonna do well into the future. So here they're coded in green, species that are probably gonna have higher growth rates than today under future conditions species which are pretty much gonna be the same or likely not too heavily affected. And the species where, in red here, where they're likely to experience uh, a decrease in growth rate or potential mortality as a result of shifting climate patterns. And so this tells us maybe where city planners need to intervene already uh, to try to address some of these challenges. I dance? You try? Oh. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> um, and so as you know, I don't think that one's better. You don't have a pointer, ah. but maybe it's less confusing. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're inheriting, uh, as city planners think about how to make their canopies more climate resilient, we also have to acknowledge that they're inheriting a green infrastructure that was planted many decades before for very different purposes. So many of our neighborhoods look something like this where there's a single species that's been planted along the, along the boulevards that look beautiful, um, but as uh, our colleagues mentioned, might not have the functional diversity needed to withstand uh, some of the stresses that climate change is gonna throw at it. And so the next step in our workflow um, is try to, to come up with an indicator that allows us to understand at a community level how we think our urban forest is gonna be uh, withstanding the stresses uh, and changes from climate change. So here we draw on work um, from Paquette de Messier, who developed an approach to look at a functional, a functional trait diversity approach to look at how uh, those different species that are comprising of our urban uh, canopy um, may be able to provide the sort of resilience that we're hoping for uh, as they confront climate change. And so this functional di diversity groups are formed by looking at seven different functional traits that are commonly available for tree species to cluster these into groups to identify sets of species which have common characteristics and common traits, and then to classify these into different groups. And so we have here five different major groups that we can see uh, for a species of urban trees in the Northeast. Um, and they range from conifers, uh, which tend to be, in general, underrepresented in uh, urban canopies, to more large-bodied, fast-growing um, deciduous trees, um, which tend to be overrepresented. And so the aim of this is to develop an indicator that allows us to look across the city at how diversified is the canopy um, from this functional trait-based perspective. And so what I'm showing you here is a map of the island of Montreal. You may have been able to pick it out, um, where we've looked at the inventory of 400,000 different public trees that are planted and uh, maintained by the city and calculated the functional diversity at a scale of about 250 meters. So we looked and aggregated up all the species that fell into those different pixels and estimated uh, their functional diversity score. And the first thing that is quite apparent is that it's very variable across the landscape. Um, there's some areas where high values of functional diversity are present, so those are areas in paler colors um, that are likely to be more resilient. And then there are areas in darker colors which have lower functional diversity and are more likely to be vulnerable uh, to impacts of climate change. On average, when you look across the city, we only have a score of about 3.7. So it's not a very diversified forest um, from the public sphere. But this means that there's a lot of opportunity to improve that uh, with new planting. And that's exactly what the city of Montreal is trying to do. So in, a few years ago, they released their climate plan, in which they have an objective to plant 500,000 new trees before 2030 to cope with climate and to also bring about these benefits that, um, that it can provide to their citizens. And one of the things that I specifically asked it for in this strategy is to make sure that as the planting moves forward, it's done so in a way that is cognizant of the climate hazards that we know are touching the landscape. And so they've provided, or they produce these different data layers um, identifying where across the landscape these different climate hazards are expected to have the most impact. And so they identified heavy rains, droughts, storms, heat waves, and floods as the five climate stressors that are most likely to touch the city in the coming decades. Um, and you can see that there's quite variable distribution about where they're gonna touch um, and who's gonna be most impacted. 
And so this tells us already about where there is a social need potentially to put in place trees to help mitigate some of these impacts for residents living in those neighborhoods. And so what we can do is we can start to compile all this different information from uh, where the climate vulnerability exists for citizens living in cities. Uh, we can create a canopy index now based on our, um, our inventory about where our trees located and who has access to those trees. We can understand something about the trees themselves, their functional diversity, how resilient do we expect them to be. And lastly, we can add in another element, which is the Canadian Index of Multiple Deprivation. This is a socioeconomic indicator, which tells us something about how able are citizens who are living in these areas to go out um, and access non-nature-based uh, solutions to address these climate change. So can they get access to air conditioning or heating or flood control, et cetera, um, that's not provided by a green space? And so we can put these things together into a multi-criteria prioritization analysis to try to suggest or identify where it's most useful to plant these 500,000 trees across the city of Montreal. And so here in shades of blue to green or blue to yellow are areas of how many tree species of that 500,000 it could be good to plant in each of these different cells based on the needs identified here. Lastly, we can come back and use a framework of functional diversity to decide what should we be planting in each of these places. So based on what's already planted in one of these uh, pixels, we can say what are the complementary functional groups that are not represented that could be planted. And we can then dig deeper into what are their tolerances to the different climate stressors that that particular pixel is affected by to provide a very concrete list to urban planners about which species they should be planting across which parts of the city. And so we modeled this out to understand does this type of approach actually have a positive impact on some of the questions that we're interested in addressing at a citywide scale. And so we created an alternative scenario. So we have our optimized scenario, which I've just presented. And then we have a business as usual status quo scenario where these 500,000 trees are planted based on just the current planting patterns. Um, and what you can see in yellow is our adapted scenario. And it performs better at trying to address some of these questions around heat waves, droughts, and storms. Um, which are actually the, the most pressing climate threats uh, affecting the city, but performed a little bit less on some of these other ones like heavy rains and floods, which tend to be uh, more focused on large canopy species. Secondly, we can also look at how there might be trade-offs with the ecosystem services that those particular trees are providing. Um, so we also ran our, uh, our scenarios through iTree to estimate some of the ecosystem service benefits that they could provide. And what we found is that as we selected species that were gonna be better adapted for climate, uh, they tended to be species that were slower growing, had smaller canopies, and actually provided less ecosystem services overall than a scenario where we continued to plant these fast growing large canopied species. And so there is potentially a trade off um, as we start to think about how we wanna structure our urban canopies to be climate resilient, acknowledging that there might be an overall decrease in ecosystem services, and so that cities might even need to double down and put even more trees on those landscapes to make up for that difference. And so this is an approach that we're really excited about. We're trying to take it across Canada. So we have a new program funded by the David Suzuki Foundation to do this work with five pilot cities across Canada. So we're working with Vancouver, Ottawa, Gatineau, Saskatoon, and Quebec um, to bring this type of data into the hands of decision makers and community members. And so this is work that's ongoing for the next couple of years, but we're very excited to, to be able to share this with you soon. Um, and with that, I'd just like to come back to my final uh, key messages which I think many of my, uh, the other presenters have highlighted that remote sensing um, can provide low cost, rapid solutions to, to identify um, data sets and inputs into a lot of our analyses that can be very helpful for managing large and small landscapes. Um, in our particular context, we found that functional diversity approaches can help to reduce uh, the social and ecological vulnerabilities to climate change, um, but there might be trade-offs that we're expected to, to encounter. And so, land managers and urban planners will have to think about that as they make their decisions on how to put in place these green infrastructures that cities are really pushing for. And I'm really excited to learn about all the different work that my colleagues have been doing about how to use some of these remote sensing techniques to even push our own work further. So hoping to maybe get into looking at forest health, um, predicting droughts, et cetera, as indicators that cities would also be interested in using and as they plan their, their work. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much. And a great thanks to my amazing team that did most of this work uh, at Habitat. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take them. <laughs>